Thank you so much for that, Allison. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, Winnie, for that wonderful song set, though I, I will say that our scripture passage made it particularly easy this week. Sometimes she looks at me and says, you want me to find music to go with that? But this week it was easy. This week it was easy and wonderful as we're going into communion as well at the end of the service. So, um, And so many do so much, both out in front and behind the scenes. We appreciate everything that you do for us. Well, you know, it's, uh, the book of Revelation is very interesting. And in fact, there are some out there that say that the book of Revelation is very, very easy to understand. In fact, if you don't think it's easy, they're, they're willing to chart it out for you when they come up with something like we have on the screen here. Now, isn't that easy to understand? <laughs> what makes it more problematic is oftentimes the charts are six or seven feet long, and you're just sitting there going, oh my gosh, you've got to be kidding me. But, but in truth, there, there are some indications in Revelation that show us when we have a transition or something else is going on. And we, we come up with one of them right away in Revelation 4.1. After this I looked, I being John the Apostle, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So this is a transition in the book of Revelation. Now, chapter 1 started off talking about how John received the message from Jesus and with a beautiful vision of Jesus Christ. Then chapters 2 and 3 were the letters to the seven churches. Now we have a transition. Now we're getting into the visionary portion of the book. And, and it's going to go through a series of judgments with seals and trumpets and bowls. And then we're going to get a, a marvelous picture of the kingdom of God uh, revitalized in a sense. We're going to see what the Garden of Eden should be and uh, restored as well. We, we're going to see how God deals with sin and the glory that is awaiting for the saints. Now, in the midst of all of this, there are some interludes. And even though this kind of starts the beginning of the seals, as we're going to see, not the, but, you know, a, a, you know just, a, a seal like you would put a seal on a document, okay? Even though this kind of starts the seals, there's an interlude here, and there are various interludes throughout, throughout the book of Revelation that makes it, makes it a little hard sometimes to figure out how you should break it up because some say, okay, we've seen the things that are, and now we're going to see the things which must take place after this. Well, we're going to see some of the things that must take place after this. Some of the things that John is going to show us may happen in the future, may have happened in the past, have indeed happened in the past. So there are interludes interspersed. But here's your basic dividing line. We have the letters to the churches in the now, okay? That these are the problems that the churches then were dealing with, the churches throughout all time deal with. That's why they're so appropriate and applicable. And we went through them and talked about the various things we should watch out for as a church. Now we're going to talk about judgment. Judgment upon sin. And we're going to find it's a deserved judgment. The people of God are crying out for the judgment. Things have gotten so bad that the entire church is crying out, God, it's time, it's time, it's time. And we probably can't imagine that yet, which probably is an indication that we aren't quite there. But we're going to see throughout the book of Revelation the judgment of God and then the kingdom of God. So this is a comfort to God's people, comfort to the people of that day and age who were dealing with serious persecution. Now, we, haven't, we aren't dealing with that in America, but you know what? There are places around the world that are dealing with the type of persecution that the church was in the book of Revelation. They're dealing with that type of persecution right now. I'm afraid one day it will come to us. And the book of Revelation will mean even more to us then because it's a reminder of the fact that God wins. It's all going to happen the way he said. Sin is going to be judged, but we don't have to worry about that because we, as his people, have experienced the grace and forgiveness through Jesus Christ, and we will be a part of his kingdom forever. So in this kind of interlude, this, this beginning of the, the seal judgments, we're going to see what 
is the job of creation. We're going to see the job of creation, but the question is, what is the job of creation? That's the question we're going to answer. And I, I've kind of, I've kind of um, given a little byplay down there. I heard this said once, and I thought it was great. Chapter 5 tells us that the job of creation is singing in the rain. R-E-I-G-N. And here is our I Don't groan, that was really good. Come on. Here's our scripture. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their head. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was as it were a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, and Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we come to you this morning. We thank you for your word to us. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us to understand what this signifies to us, what we should take from this, what our job should be as your people, as your creation. Help us to understand that you are worthy, that you are mighty, that you are holy. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to leave this place with a vision of you that just blows our minds. And dear Heavenly Father, I pray if there's anyone here this morning struggling to know you or struggling in their relationship with you, that through the power of your word and the power of your spirit, you would reach out to them and help them to understand that you desire a relationship with them through Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, first of all, we see here the king is sitting on his throne, Revelation 4, 2. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Here John is caught up to the very throne room of God, and it signifies that God is in charge of his creation. We read this from Psalm 47, 8. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. If he is sitting on his throne, then all is right in the universe. And we can, we can trust him and, and know that he has everything working towards a wonderful and marvelous conclusion. Nothing that is happening is beyond his purview. He has a plan and he is acting on it. And it's a reminder, too, uh, what we see here at the end of the passage, that we owe him homage, we owe him praise. We should declare his name to be holy and great. And his very presence is majestic and awe-inspiring, Revelation 4, 2 and 3. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. So a one-color rainbow, which may sound strange, but it's pulling up imagery from the Old Testament. And I'm going to share with you a, numerous passages from the Old Testament because we have to understand as we go through Revelation that this, this, is, this all has context. And it's, it's using language and images and ideas that come from the Jewish scriptures as it's revealing to us what God is doing and what God will do. So we go back to Ezekiel 1, 26 through 28. 
And above the expanse, over their heads, was the likeness of a throne, an appearance like a sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, gleaming metal, like the appearance of a fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and there was brightness around him, like the appearance of a bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of his brightness all around. So here we have a vision of God pulled directly from the vision that was given to Ezekiel. You know, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't astound us that the way God appeared to one of his prophets in the Old Testament would be the way he would appear to one of his apostles in the New. But this is a reminder of the continuity and the interconnectedness. And the, and the truth is that we can't really fully understand the book of Revelation unless we understand what, it is being, what is being revealed in it from the Old Testament as well. So here is God in all his glory, in all his majesty, uh, just magnificent, awe-inspiring, uh, an emerald rainbow over his throne. And his attendants are before him. Revelation 4.4, 4, around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. Now... Here's where we start to get into the weeds. Because up until this point in the book of Revelation, I can, I can honestly say there's been a fair bit of agreement in what various passages mean. I mean, there's, there's, there, you know, there's some squabbling about different things in the seven churches and how tied they might be to that day and age and what the different things revealed about Jesus Christ and the churches, how they correlate to one another. You know, there's a little bit of quibbling here and there, but now we're starting to get into the part of the book of Revelation where everybody thinks something different. So I'm not going to try and give you every idea. I'm just going to try and give you some of the ideas that I think are the most pertinent and try and share with you what I think is probably right. So you've got 24 thrones and 24 elders, and why would there be 24? Well, there's, there's some general agreement. This kind of goes back to the idea that there are 24 different divisions of the priesthood. So you might have, you know, these attendants before God might represent those 24 divisions of priests. First Chronicles 24, 3 and 4. And with the help of Zadok and the sons of Eleazar and Ahimelech and the sons of Ithamar, David organized them according to the appointed duties in their service. They organized them under 16 heads of fathers' houses of the sons of Eleazar and eight of the sons of Ithamar. So 24 divisions of priests. So that's probably the 24. And then 24 elders. Are, are these uh, counselors to God? Well, why would God need counselors? You know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Are these angelic beings that are going to end up worshiping him? Well, I think they are representative, honestly, of the people of God throughout the ages, okay? And the reason I say that is because there are 24 of them, and I think that represents the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. And we see them mentioned at the end of the book of Revelation, Revelation 21:12. It had a great high wall. This is the New Jerusalem with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels. And on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. So yeah, there you have the, the people of Israel represented, the people of God. And then Revelation 21:14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So you have, I think here, in, 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 in picture form, all the people of God surrounding the throne. And remember, each one of the, the churches at the beginning, or several of them, were going to get crowns. That, that's like a victor's wreath that represented their, their conquering through the name of Jesus Christ. Well, they're throwing crowns before his feet, and what would be more appropriate than to have the people of God throwing the very crowns that Jesus got for them at the feet of the throne of God. So I think that 24, although might be there because of the 24 priests, could be angels. These represent the people of God before the throne of God, ultimately ending up worshiping God. And the reason I say that the, his attendants are before him rather than saying, you know, the church throughout the age is before him is because there is no great, dis, there's no great agreement on what these 24 elders mean. Could be angels, 
could be the people of God, could represent Israel, though there's a very small minority that believe that this only represents Israel. I think it's the, the representatives of the apostles, representatives of the tribes, all the people of God gathered before God, ready to worship him. And God is in his heavenly sanctuary. We're in the throne room, certainly. But it's more than the throne room because it's kind of like a temple. Revelation 4, 5, and 6. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass-like crystal. And this goes back to images, images from the Old Testament because we had candelabras in the temple, Exodus 24, 31 through 39. You shall make a lamp stand of pure gold. You shall make seven lamps for it, and the lamp shall be set up so as to give light on the space in the front of it. Its tongs and the trays shall be of pure gold. It shall be made with all the utensils out of a talent of pure gold. So you had the golden lamp stand with seven lamps on it. And then you had... The um, basin of bronze, Exodus 30, 17 through 19, and the Lord said to Moses, you shall also make a basin of bronze with its stand of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it with which Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet. And you might say, well, what does a basin of bronze have to do with a sea of glass? I'm glad you asked. Because this basin of bronze is called this in 2 Chronicles 4, 1 through 2. Then he made the sea of cast metal. It was round, 10 cubits from brim to brim, and 5 cubits high, and a line of 30 cubits measured its circumference. So a sea of glass like crystal, I think, represents a sea of bronze, which is the basin to wash in, and you have the, the golden lampstand with the seven lamps that represents the candelabras in the temple. And not only do I think we see a vision here of the throne room of God revealed as a temple to God, but we also see God in his triune glory. And perhaps I'm reading just a little bit into this because of what comes along in chapter 5. Because if you think communion is appropriate for what we're talking about today, oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Chapter 5 is all about Jesus. He is the one worthy to open the scroll. But perfectly appropriate for today as well. But I'm looking ahead perhaps a little bit to see what we have revealed in chapter 5 and understanding that Jesus throughout the entirety of the book of Revelation is revealed as God the Son. We have the triune God, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son revealed in Scripture in the book of Revelation. Jesus is the Word of God. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is, in fact, not just a man, not just a prophet, not just a Messiah. He is indeed God. So we have that revealed throughout Revelation. I think we have a, a, a hint of the Trinity here in the passage we're reading. Um, same, same passage of Scripture. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass-like crystal. Well, we, we find the flashing and the thunder and all that representative of God the Father as revealed in the Old Testament. Uh, take a passage like Exodus 19, 16 through 19. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so all the people in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like a smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder." It's no wonder we have Lord represented here, God the Father represented it in thunder and lightning. But then we also have the Holy Spirit represented as the seven spirits of God. And this comes from uh, uh, Zechariah 4, verses uh, 1 through 2, and then 4 through 6, where the, the Spirit is representative as, represented as the lampstand. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl on top of it and seven lamps on it, with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. 
And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by my spirit, but no, no, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The, the lampstand represents the spirit of God, and the seven is a significant number from Isaiah 11, 2. Because Isaiah 11, 2 shows us the sevenfold description of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon the Messiah and the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So you have the Father on the throne represented by the thunder and lightning. You have the lampstand which represents the seven spirits of God. And then you have the golden basin which represents the entire sacrificial system which points us to Jesus Christ who is worthy to open the scroll. And we read this about Jesus in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. So we have God the Father on his throne. We have the seven spirits before the throne representing the Holy Spirit. We have the washstand representing the cleansing of Jesus Christ. We have the Trinity revealed for us in the holy tabernacle of God, the throne room of God himself. And we see creation depicted as it should be. What is the job of creation, remember? What is the job of creation? Well, here it is. Revelation 4, 6 through 11. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And once again, this does not just pop out of a vacuum here. This, this relies on imagery and illustrations from the Old Testament. Going back to Ezekiel and Ezekiel 1, And I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north and a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually. And in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming metal. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot and they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under the wings on their four sides they had human hands and the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. The four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces and their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while two covered their bodies. Magnificent. Awesome. Obviously, representative, symbolic, but showing us something about the majesty of God and the attendance of God and the creation of God. And we see this in Isaiah 6, 1 through 3. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Wow. Exactly, almost word for word, what we have in the book of Revelation. So this is all tied together, and this all reminds us of, once again, the glory of God, the majesty of God, the wonder of God, not just of him, but of his creation. This, this, this is fantastic. This is magical. This is um, what is CGI stuff, right? This is the Avengers on another level. Come on. I mean, this is amazing. But this is all to depict 
to us. The wonder of God, the beauty of his creation, the, the majesty of his being, and these creatures that I believe represent his creation here show us how we are to respond to God. As amazing and magnificent as they are, they only have one thought in mind, and that is to worship the one on the throne. They are devoted, and we should be devoted. Night and day, they never cease worshiping God. We're reminded by Jesus that the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's the greatest commandment. That's what we are supposed to be. We are to be devoted like the four living creatures are. And then, what do we do with that devotion? We worship. We are to be worshiping the one who is on the throne. That is the job of creation, to be devoted to the Creator and to worship Him forever. We're to give honor and glory and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne. And we see here not just the four living creatures, these angelic beings responding to God this way, the, the elders, which I think represent the church throughout the ages, the people of God throughout the ages, all taking the crowns that they got because of God, throwing them at his feet. They are worshiping the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him. This is the job of God's people to worship him. We read this in 1 Chronicles 16, 28 through 30. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. We're to worship him. Because he is majestic and awesome and glorious and what he has done in creating us and making this creation is inspiring, awe-inspiring. We are to call him glory. We are to worship his name. We are to call him great. And then we are to do something else. Because you might say, well, I mean, you look at the Bible and you don't see the people here on this earth just sitting around all day worshiping. I mean, you've got you to gotta make food. You've got to you know, plant, got to farm. You've got you to gotta work. You've got to eat. You've got to do all these other things while you're here on this earth. Yes, you do. But in the midst of that, you worship God by giving him the glory in everything that you do. We read this in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We worship God by giving him our lives. We worship God by giving him our thoughts. We worship God by giving him our actions. Everything that we do here on this earth should be something that is good and acceptable and perfect in his life. That is a part of our worship. So while worship is certainly praising God, while worship is certainly singing for, for God, while worship is certainly praying to God, while worship is certainly looking at the word of God, worship is also living every moment of our lives to him because we are to be devoted to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, speaking of praise, these four living creatures are honoring God. They're recognizing certain things about God. They're acknowledging certain things about God. And you know what? If there's one thing we know from Scripture is that God loves having his attributes proclaimed. I mean, that's part of what praise is. We tell God we understand how great he is. And one thing he is is holy. He is holy. And you know, and, and as we go through the Bible, we have a lot of the different attributes of God they are called in theological terms. The, the, one, the one that is most prevalent and prominent in our world today is the idea that God is love. I mean, that's right in Scripture. God is love. And yep, God is love. You know the only attributes that's repeated, and it's repeated three times, and it's done twice in the Bible? Holy. 
His holiness. Holy, holy, holy. He is perfect. He is other. He is different. He is separate. Hosea 11.9 says this, I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Now that's in this instance. What we find in Revelation is He is the Holy One and He is coming in wrath. And the whole of creation is crying out for Him to come in wrath. The church is crying out, they have killed us. They have killed your people. They are doing unspeakable things. They are saying horrible things about you. They're, they're engaging people in idolatry and people are worshiping false gods. How long can you let it go on? And if you don't like the holiness of God, you aren't going to like the rest of the book of Revelation at all. Maybe until we get to the very end. Oh, new heavens, new earth, wiping away the tears, all of that. Isn't that wonderful? You know what the rest of it is from here on till then? Judgment. Judgment, judgment, judgment. Because things have gotten so bad, particularly from God's perspective, that the people of God all cry out uniformly, universally, it is time. God is holy. Sin is abominable to him. And we have to understand that. And we have to recognize that He is perfect. He is righteous. He is magnificent. He is separate. He is other. And we have to give Him the praise. He is also almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. Or as it says in Isaiah, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. He has all the power, he has all the control, he is sovereign, and he has the host of heaven's armies with him. And we, we find this in Revelation 19, 14, talking about Jesus Christ coming. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. God is in his throne room. He is in control. He controls the host of heaven. He is sovereign. He is holy. He is almighty, and he is eternal. This is one way he's different than we are. We were created. Now we're told that from now we're going to continue, but we were created. He is eternal. He lives forever and ever. He is he, the one who was and is and is to come, repeating what we read in Revelation chapter 1. And maybe giving an allusion to Jesus Christ coming back to the earth, but most recognize this, that that this is a reference to the fact that God is eternal. He lives forever. He is the way he is revealed in Exodus 3.14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am. Not I was, I will be. I am because I always am. I am always, forever and ever. Now put on your theologian hat for just a minute. I'm going to repeat something we talked about in Revelation chapter 1. Uh, this, this refers to the, uh, oh, I've got to see if I can get this pronunciation right, uh, aseity of God. And that basically refers to the fact that God is self-existent. Now here, here's a fancy definition that comes from the idea of the attributes of God. This is one of his attributes. God is the only absolutely independent being. His existence and well-being is not dependent upon any being or circumstance. He is the final and primary cause of all things. Therefore, there is no cause that precedes him. He is in need of nothing. So that last bit might be the most important bit there. But this is all a very fancy way with fancy terms of saying that God is eternal. He's always been. He always will be. He doesn't depend on anyone else. He doesn't need anyone else. He is. But he created us so that we could be with him. He is worthy. And he's revealed here as worthy because he is creator. We could go to Genesis 1. God created the heavens and the earth. I like 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And what's kind of neat about this verse, it goes on to say, um, and there is one God, the Son, from whom are all things and for, all, for whom we exist, or approximately the same thing. It's repeating the fact that Father and Son are, are God. But, you know, it's just, it's just God created us. He didn't need us, but he created us. And he loves us. And he loves us even though 
we've all rebelled and sinned against him. Happened right at the very beginning of the Garden of Eden. Here, God creates this marvelous universe in all its complexity. I mean, you go out and look at the night sky, and you see the stars, and you go, oh, that's pretty cool. And then you look in a, mic- in a, in a telescope, and you see the, the, the rings surrounding planets, and you see the various nebulas, and on a very, very dark night, maybe, maybe you can't do this where you live in your yard now, but go out into one of the state parks, and you, know, you might say, oh yeah, cool stars. Go out in the night when you can see the Milky Way. It's just, it's just glowing and, and, and swirling and white spots. and it's just, it's just magnificent. And in the midst of this beautiful, wonderful creation, he took the earth and he made the earth his focus. And he made man the pinnacle of his creation. And almost immediately, you know what man said? I don't need you. (laughs) I don't need to follow you. I can do my own thing. What an affront to a holy and righteous and perfect God. It's enough that man, mankind, should be doomed forever. But God didn't see it that way. God provided a way for us to be forgiven. And that way is Jesus Christ. You see, God is not only worthy because he is creator, he is worthy because he is redeemer. And we're going to talk next week a lot about Jesus as redeemer in Revelation chapter 5. He is the lion who is the lamb who is worthy to open the scroll. He is the the focus of God's plan of redemption. But God has a significant part to play in all this, and we see that reveal in Galatians 1, 3 through 5. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. Okay, Jesus gave himself according to the will of of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. See, God the Father had a part to play in, in redemption too. Jesus performed the act, but God the Father was a part of it, as was the Holy Spirit, the triune God working in perfect unity to do what mankind could not do, because we cannot obtain forgiveness, because even the smallest amount of sin in our lives is enough to keep us away from a perfect and righteous God a holy God. So this is the plan of redemption. Even though mankind sinned, even though we sin, God loves us. God wants us to have a relationship with him. So Jesus Christ, the second person of the triune Godhead, which blows our minds to begin with, the second person left heaven, came to this earth, lived a perfect life, so that he could be a perfect sacrifice and die in our place. That was the whole point of revealing the sacrificial system to the people of Israel. Sin is horrible. Sin is horrific. Something has to be done to take care of sin. Only life, only blood can take care of sin. But not human blood. It was the blood of sacrifices. The only human that could die for us is the perfect man who was indeed God, who took our sin upon himself when he died on the cross. God took care of the price we owed for our sin. God did it all. That's why he's worthy. We shook our fist in his face at creation, and God said, I love you anyway. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We just have to come to the point in our lives where we say, God, I recognize I've done wrong, I recognize I can't make it right, but you can and you did through Jesus Christ, and I believe in him. And that is the whole point of communion this morning. Communion reminds us of what God did through Christ on our behalf. And if you don't have one of these, just raise your hand and one of our ushers will be happy to make sure you get one. When we partake of this here, we we look at this as a metaphor. This is a reminder of God's great love. It's a reminder of our sin, but it's also a reminder of God's great love. Of Jesus Christ's 
ultimate sacrifice for our sins. And if for some reason you don't want to participate, it makes you uncomfortable, you're not sure you believe the same way, that's, that's fine. But what we are doing here this morning is remembering Jesus Christ's sacrifice for our sins. We're remembering God's love for us. And this is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And what we're doing in the book of Revelation is we are looking at everything that God says is happening, going to happen, will happen until Jesus Christ does come and one day set up his kingdom here on this earth. New heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem, new people. And I got to tell you, that's one of the things I look forward to most of all. To see Jesus and be changed in an instant because when we are changed when we are given our new nature fully and completely when we are fixed and our sin natures are taken away we'll get to see God hallelujah Hallelujah. let's go to God in prayer dear heavenly father we come to you and we thank you for what you have done for us through Jesus Christ and Lord we, we stand in awe of you in your holy tabernacle on your glorious throne with the thunder and the lightning and the emerald rainbow and the, the glory and the majesty of your creation. We see angelic beings that we can't even fully imagine. We know Hollywood would try, but I don't even think they'd capture it right. It's just, just, just jaw-dropping, Lord. And then we are gathered before your throne, called to worship, recognizing your holiness, your devotion, your majesty, and throwing the crowns that you have provided for us at your feet. Lord, we long for that day. We look forward to that day. And the one thing we pray over and over again, more and more as time goes on, is Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen.